there was a, there was a really remarkable Batson challenge after the peremptories were exercised. The the defense did make a Batson challenge that they alleged the prosecutors were striking too many white males, and they did actually also mention in passing that three Republicans were struck.、Um, the judge found essentially that not even a prima facie case was made. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, January twelfth, two thousand twenty-three. It's Proud Boys Trial Day at the Barrett Prettyman Courthouse in Washington D.C. Five leaders of the right-wing paramilitary gang go on trial today in a ten-count seditious conspiracy indictment, and Roger Parloff, Lawfare Senior Editor, will be there live blogging it for the site. You can find the live blog in the show notes of this podcast and on the Lawfare site, as well as on his Twitter feed. But Roger joined me the eve of the trial in the virtual jungle studio to talk about this second major seditious conspiracy indictment. We talked about how it compares with the Oath Keepers case, which wrapped up over the fall. We talked about how the evidence is different. The Proud Boys being a bit more into the whole violence thing than the Oath Keepers, we talked about whether there was a plan, and we talked about whether these guys can get a fair trial in the overwhelmingly Democratic District of Columbia. It's the Lawfare Podcast, January twelfth. Boys, be not proud with Roger Parloff. So, Roger, you covered. For lawfare, the Oath Keepers trial in its entirety, and today the Proud Boys trial gets started. Who are the Proud Boys, and specifically, who are the defendants, and what are they charged with? So the Proud Boys are this organization of、uh, several hundred people that、uh, were started by Gavin McGinnis. I forget. Exactly、uh, when at the moment,、uh, I think around two thousand eight, and th- they called themselves、uh, Western chauvinists and、uh, un- unapologetic, and they're、uh, basically believed to be a, a right wing extremist group. But it's disputed whether they are racist or not. But they are they are overwhelmingly a white group. They are overwhelmingly. A male group, but、um, there are exceptions, at least to the to the white. And in fact,、uh, the the leader at the time of January sixth identifies as African Cuban or Afro Cuban. That's Enrique Tario. The five defendants are the leaders of the、uh, Proud Boys on January sixth. The chairman Enrique Tario. And then Tario, it happens, was actually arrested two days before January sixth. So he was not, and he was ordered to leave the city. So he was not present on January sixth. And his lieutenants, alleged lieutenants, are the main defendants. Nordine,、uh, Ethan Nordine of Auburn, Washington. He was thirty at the time.、Uh, Joe Biggs of Ormond Beach, Florida. He was thirty-seven at the time. He used to be an employee of Infowars or、uh, Alex Jones Group.、Uh, Zach Rell of Philadelphia. He was 35 at the time. Originally,、uh, another defendant who pled guilty named Charles Donahoe. He might be a, a witness from Kennersville, North Carolina. And then、um, the fifth defendant here is named Dominic Pizzola, and he wasn't really. A leader of the group, he was sort of a tough guy from Rochester, New York, and、uh, he was happens to be the guy, the proud boy, who、uh, broke the first window on the Capitol on January sixth at two thirteen p.m. He broke the window pane just to the right of the Senate wing door, and then he and some of the others. He was one of the first into the. Capital, and uh, that's where uh, uh, the breach really begins. All right, so 
the charge here, this is a second seditious conspiracy case. Is that correct? Yeah. In fact, you could call it a third. After the first Oath Keepers case, there is another underway right now. Uh, the, the rest of the Oath Keepers that were originally in that indictment, there were four others. Uh, there were It was a n- nine people in the original Oath Keepers seditious conspiracy uh, indictment, and they couldn't fit all nine into one courtroom. So a second one is underway right now. And then this is the, the third. But yes, it's the second seditious conspiracy indictment, you could say. And what is distinctive about the Proud Boys among all of the people who were charged with storming the Capitol? Uh, yes, uh, they were on the violent end of things, as opposed to the people who just kind of wandered in. But why are they charged with seditious conspiracy when lots of other people are merely charged with, you know, punching a cop or breaking a window? Yeah, they it's it's actually maybe the, the most important prosecution, at least given the government's theory. It's a more important case than the Oath Keepers, really, in this respect. Proud Boys were present at many crucial moments in the storming of the Capitol. The the storming begins at a place called the Peace Circle, just northwest of the Capitol, and they were there. And the first person to topple a barricade, although not himself a proud boy, his name is Ryan Samsel, moments before he topples it, he puts his arm on defendant Joe Biggs shoulder and they have a talk and then one and then he takes this arm off the shoulder and he walks right up to the barricade and he topples it and then that's where everything begins and then there's a second they uh, the the proud boys and they're they're the group is about 200 to 300 proud boys among other rioters and they continue up toward the capital they allegedly nordine and uh, one of the other defendants helps to dismantle a barrier, and then th- th- they reach the West Plaza. At that point, the, a line of police is holding them successfully for a period, and then another proud boy is crucial in allegedly breaking a barrier at uh, a line of police at the uh, uh, under the inaugural scaffolding that leads to a stairway up to the Upper West Terrace. That's another crucial moment in the successful storming of the Capitol. They go up, and then Pozzola, as I mentioned, um, Defendant Pozzola uh, is the first to break a window, and and so on. And so it's it, they are sort of uh, the Proud Boys are seem to be at many of the crucial spots at crucial times, uh, playing a crucial role. And and the argument is that. Um, this was there there was a plan of sorts yeah so the the main defense in the case of the oath keepers which the jury ultimately rejects is that there really wasn't a plan and that you know they kind of had a lot of rhetoric but there was no real plan to storm the capital there was a plan to you know kind of have a revolution and oh look, people are storming the Capitol. Let's let's join, and we know how to do stack formation. But then the Oath Keepers go in. They don't really do very much once they're inside, and they, you know, don't seem to have led the violence. It sounds like the Proud Boys are much more accused of being the sort of pointy end of the violent spear. Is the government's contention that? the Proud Boys sparked the violence that happened on January 6th, that they are kind of responsible for the, you know, you have Trump gives his speech, you have people march to the Capitol, and then the Proud Boys kind of forced entry. Or is it more complicated than that? Well, first, I agree with everything you said, contrasting the Oath Keepers to them. The Oath Keepers if there was a plan, it was a plan at 30,000 feet. Gee, we would like to stop the uh, 
uh, transfer of presidential power somehow by any means necessary, including force. But there was not a plan to storm the Capitol, and they aren't the, you know, the Capitol gets breached, and then they sort of seem to congeal on a plan, oh, let's take advantage of this. It's opportunistic. And like you said, the theory of this case is that, no, these guys are more the pointy end of this of the spear. I don't think they get into the question, would there have been uh, a riot without them? Would there have been an insurrection without them? But certainly they play a crucial role. And uh, that uh, that's the government's case. And in fact, there's some evidence. There's a email that while the riot, while the insurrection is occurring at, at like 2.39 p.m., uh, T- Tario uh, writes to one of his other people, uh, make no mistake, we did this. So um, there's there's going to be a claim that they uh, this was what they wanted Boasted to happen. Boasted about it. Yeah. And then later that evening, there's a similar conversation between Tario and another proud boy named Jeremy Bertino, who's expected to be, he's pled guilty, he's expected to be a witness. Bertino says, brother, you know we made this happen. And Tario responds, I know. So it is easy for violence-prone people to take credit for things that already happened. If I were the government, though, I would want evidence of them saying, we're going to make this happen. You do this, I'll do this, you do this, and we'll cause a riot. How clear is the prospective evidence that they intended to make it happen, which I would think would be necessary for purposes of a seditious conspiracy charge? Yeah, I would say it's they do not have a written plan or or an oral plan beforehand that, you know, you do this, you do this, you come in from the left. I don't think we're going to hear that sort of evidence. What you do have you do have the same sorts of inflammatory rhetoric that you had with the Oath Keepers, beginning with basically the uh, election. But then there there is a point when, a- after Trump issues his will be, uh, tweet on December 19th, it'll be wild, calling for everybody to come to a January 6th protest. The next day, Tario creates a new chapter of the Proud Boys called Ministry of Self-Defense. And he, he creates a, a telegram channel called Ministry of Self-Defense Leaders Group. And then they begin recruiting people into a Ministry of Self-Defense Members Group. And it's going to be very hierarchical, which is not, which is not common for the Proud Boys. It, it's a, you know, it sort of can come off like a drinking group uh, until now. And, and then on December 28th, he and other defendants begin informing the others, we will not be wearing our traditional black and yellow. We will be incognito on January 6th. So that's a huge change. You know, part of being a proud boy is, is you know, wearing your colors. They wear black and yellow. They have these sort of Fred Perry laurel insignias. They've actually sort of appropriated the Fred Perry symbol, but they're not going to do that. And the reason they seem to be saying they're not going to do that is so that they can blend in with other rioters who won't realize that they are proud boys. And this is the part of the government's case, that they are going to incite the quote unquote normies, the 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 non-organized thugs into rioting. And they turn them in effect into their tools. And they have bullhorns and they lead chants and they in help incite this riot. And that's the theory. And there is, you know, there is evidence of all of this. And then they begin bringing Baofeng radios. They have GoFundMe drives to uh, wear, to uh, fund protective wear. And so there is planning, but you still don't have a, a smoking gun sort of document or a or a a video conference, a taped video conference where the plans are laid out. But you do have 
in a way that you only sort of did with the Oath Keepers, you do have witnesses because more than one of the Proud Boy defendants has flipped and will presumably testify. Is that right? Well, yes, but of course, uh, there were Oath Keepers who flipped and testified. And the problem there was that some of them said on the witness stand, even as government witnesses, that aspects of this were... uh, Spontaneous, yeah. Spontaneous, yeah. But yes, there will be... uh, Donahoe pled guilty. He was one of the original. Um, Jeremy Bertino has pled guilty to seditious conspiracy. He's expected to testify. There's a guy in the indictment he's referred to as uh, person three, um, John C. Stewart. He has pled guilty under seal. One of Tario's uh, lawyers blurted that out at at one hearing. So we don't know precisely what he pled to or whether he'll be a witness. But yeah, we do, we do have witnesses. And there's also very strong circumstantial evidence, just this fact they gather on the Washington Monument at 10 a.m. They do not attend the ellipse speech. They go straight to the Capitol. They, they walk around the Capitol and then they congregate at the peace circle at 10 of 1. And of course, that's crucial. 1, 1 p.m. is when the joint session begins. And then they are there at 12.53 p.m. when the first barricade is toppled. And they are there, like I said, at the West Plaza. And they are there at the inaugural scaffolding. And so there's a strong sense, circumstantial case. And then, of course, there's the there's the comments afterwards, we did this. And there was a strong uh, hierarchy where we know the leaders group was being very secretive and they were choosing this larger group, but not necessarily explaining to the larger group what was going on. And then I guess another piece of evidence is that when Tario is arrested on January 4th, He's arrested for something he did at one of the earlier, what's called the Million Man 2 march on December 12th. He had burned, uh, participated in the burning of a BLM, Black Lives Matter banner. When he's arrested, there's tremendous concern among all the defendants because the government now has his phone. And so they begin deleting the previous Ministry of Self-Defense um, telegram groups or, or nuking them, as a, a couple of the defendants say, and creating a new Ministry of Self-Defense leaders group and a new Ministry of Self-Defense members group. So there's some pretty strong circumstantial evidence. And per- perhaps when when the trial starts, uh, uh, there I'll see see this differently. Maybe the defense will present more evidence. But with the Oath Keepers, they were nominally there performing personal security details, more than nominally. I mean, that's what they were doing. They had a function and uh, they had assignments. And that's not really in dispute. They were representing Roger Stone. Here, it's not clear what the alibi is? Why, you know, why did three hundred people gather at the Washington Monument and then walk directly to the Capitol and begin right. circling? You know, so uh, a lot of it, at this stage at least, hits me as stronger than the Oath Keepers case. But you'd still, though, feel better if they were able among the people that they'd flipped to put on a witness who says. Yeah, the point was always to store the store in the capital. That's what Enrique was talking about from the beginning. And, you know, yes, your, your circumstantial evidence corresponds to, in fact, a real plot, right? I mean, it would be odd if you'd had as many flipped people as they do and not be able to put on such testimony. Yeah, but I think what the government would say is the same thing it said in the Oath Keepers case, which is that the conspiracy is not to storm the Capitol. The conspiracy is to 
use force if necessary to do everything necessary to prevent the presidential transfer of power, everything up to and including force. That's the theory. That's the plan. And then you play it by ear to some extent. This is the way it unfolded. I, I think it's it's obvious that part of the plan here was to at least surround the Capitol and intimidate the legislators. And perhaps they didn't realize that w- they would succeed in actually breaching the Capitol. As, as you, and here again, it, it's a little stronger, the evidence than in the Oath Keepers case. As you approach, maybe around January 3rd, uh, so three days before, one of the uh, one of the Proud Boys, uh, John C. Stewart, writes, I-, "I mean, the main operating theater should be out in front of the Capitol building." And uh, defendant uh, Real Zachary Real responds, "Yes, the Capitol is a quote good start." And then on January fourth, the morning, Tario writes, "I didn't hear this voice note until now." You want to storm the Capitol. Uh, so they begin to really talk. Uh, there's evidence that they begin to focus uh, in those days on on the Capitol. And, and then they gather and, and they walk directly toward the Capitol. Yeah, OK, so that's getting there, that, that, that some real direct evidence that what happened was the point rather than a byproduct of circumstance. Um, so talk to me about the defense. Uh, with the Oath Keepers, you had this complicated defense that there was no real plan. They are allowed to store weapons and bank weapons in Virginia. They came in here to do bodyguarding. And then, yeah, they they stormed the Capitol, but that was never intended. So it wasn't really a conspiracy to do that, much less a seditious one, uh, although there was seditious, as you put it, fetching. What's the defense here? Uh, an important part will be there was no plan uh, and the sort of argument you were making just earlier. You've, you've flipped a bunch of people. Nobody says, look, here, here's our plan. There, there was something maybe sometime in December, somebody, a former girlfriend of, of Tario's, sends him something called 1776 Returns. And it's it's sort of a plan, but it's a plan for something they didn't do. It's a plan to occupy other buildings, including House of Representatives buildings, you know, like the Senate office building, congressional office buildings, maybe they, even other government office buildings, but not the Capitol. So there is no plan. That will be one defense. Apparently, uh, at least one of the defendants is also going to argue that there were people that uh, there were informants in the crowd. That the, the claim is not going to be that the government instigated the riot, but that there were Proud Boys who were uh, confidential human sources to the FBI and that they also were not reporting back that there was a plan to storm the Capitol. And so they're going to try to argue, and it's unclear to what degree they will get this evidence in if if any of these people will be willing to testify. But these sort of people that the FBI trusted enough to use them as informants were at least in the dark. But like I said, there were tiers of knowledge in this group. So, uh, you know, they might simply not have been in a position to know what the Ministry of Self-Defense leaders were were planning. But I, I think the, the, the no plan aspect of it will be crucial as it was in the Oath Keepers case. I would say another, I don't, this is not exactly a defense. I would say that maybe this is a different subject, that if they are convicted, there will be a big issue on appeal about the jury, whether whether you could get a fair and impartial jury in, in D.C. On, on these charges. Yeah, so let's talk about that. You wrote a long piece on Lawfare about venue in the uh, Oath Keepers and Proud Boys cases. The Oath Keepers got nowhere with this, but you think there's uh, maybe more to be said for 
the argument with respect to the Proud Boys. Why and how do you think this is likely to play out? Yeah, I I think just the jury selection process, and I was surprised by this, it was much harder in the Proud Boys case to, to find jurors that were just not emotionally furious with the, with the Proud Boys, I did not feel personally offended by everything they stood for. And do you think that's because they're, I mean, I, I sort of think of the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers as kind of two sides of the same coin, uh, right-wing paramilitary organizations of young men who, sometimes middle-aged men who really like beating people up. I, I don't think of the Proud Boys as especially more so than the Oath Keepers. But your impression is that more D.C. residents know who they are and are kind of viscerally angry at them than the Oath Keepers? Yes, that was what came through in jury selection. And and in fairness, I, I mean, the judge, it was more than two weeks of very careful jury selection. And, you know, he, he, he disqualified for cause a great many people in order to get presumably a fair jury. But... Uh, in that process, that, that was a, a much more difficult process than with the Oath Keepers. And one thing, of course, was there was this incident in December in D.C. where there were skirmishes uh, after the Trump rallies and the, the Black Lives Matter banner was was pulled down from a historically black church and burned by the Proud Boys. And a lot of people remember that. And some of the jurors, are, you know, have marched in, I mean, have attended Black Lives Matters rallies. And, and I think also the misogyny aspect of it, many jurors picked up on, uh, they, they associate the Proud Boys, at least with misogyny, as well as with uh, frankly, with some things that they aren't, so, you know, they Charlottesville, uh, you know, I don't think all of these are, are fair associations, but for whatever reason, they came up. Okay, but so after two weeks of jury selection, we have a jury, none of whose members needed to be struck for cause. What is the remaining venue argument? If the If the argument is, hey, I can't get a fair trial here because there are no you know no but no jurors who don't hate me because of uh, associations with the proud boys and then you admittedly over a protracted period of time manage to seat a jury uh, that is lawful what's the basis for appeal I think there's two one is it, it's you know it's been recognized that if if the jury pool is evincing extraordinary animus, and you finally find 12 people who say, no, I, I think I can be fair. I mean, I have strong feelings about what happened, and you know, I don't like what the Proud Boys stand for, uh, but I can put that aside. In the context of all of this sort of vile, overt, I'm, uh, not really vile, I mean, uh, I, you know, I, I agree with them. I mean, uh, all of this overt animus toward, toward the group, the fact that you can find 12 eventually who profess and who even may believe they can be fair, at some point you can look through that and say, you know, maybe there's some unconscious bias remaining and this was not a good idea. And and some of the seated, I mean, I'm in the process now of, of going more carefully through the seated jurors, but, you know, obviously nobody says, I like what the Proud Boys stand for. I'm not sure that, that you need that, but there are people on the jury who say, I don't like what the Proud Boys stand for, but I can be fair. There are people that say, yeah, I, I attended a Black Lives Matter rally, but I can be fair. And I attended uh, an anti-gun rally, but, but I can be fair. And I think there's material there. And then I think that the, the real wild card is, you know, defending if this goes to the Supreme Court and, you know, any precedents don't matter anymore. There's also the issue of 
just the unusual, overwhelmingly democratic jurisdiction. You know, about 92 percent voted against Trump. And Trump is in this case. Trump is, you know, we're going to see the uh, clip from the September 2020 primary where Trump tells the uh, Proud Boys to stand back and stand by. And uh, we know from the Watergate case called Ehrlichman that the N-Bank DC circuit rejected the notion that you could have, uh, that, that, you know, the jury needs to be uh, sort of uh, politically uh, diverse. But one judge dissented, McGowan, and he said, no, with a case like this, this is just uh, unfair. And of course, uh, and uh, the numbers were not as severe back in the 70s as they are right now. And this is it, the, the defendant's claim, defense lawyers claim that there are no uh, Republicans on this jury. We, we don't know. That's not in the record. And their names are you know, sealed to protect them. And, and, and the prosecutors do claim that at least one seated juror used to work on the Hill for Republicans uh, at some point in his career, so might be a Republican. But um, it's quite possible that none of these jurors are Republicans. And um, I don't know what the current Supreme Court would do with that situation. So I find it very hard to believe that the current Supreme Court would say that you have a right to, that's kind of like a, a political Batson challenge, right? So B yeah. Batson, I think, is the case where peremptory strikes exercised on the basis of race or, you know, invalidate a trial. And here you'd have to adopt, it would be for cause, but you'd have to argue sort of that if you choose an overwhelmingly democratic district to go commit your violent crimes in, you have a right to sort of political representation on the jury, which I think is, I, I would think that would be a pretty hard sell. And I, I honestly don't know which justices would be most likely, you know, you could say, well, maybe the conservatives would be sympathetic because this was a pro-Trump rally. But this is exactly the kind of principle that conservative justices could normally be expected to be most hostile to. So I, I, I wonder if the better argument from on this appeal would look more like your, your first argument, which is, I'm not saying I, I get political representation on the jury. I am saying that somebody who went to a Black Lives Matter rally shouldn't be on my jury, given that I'm somebody who's infamous for having burned a Black Lives Matter flag stolen from a Black church in Washington. And that the fact that you could only get a group of people who are aware of and very much disapprove of my organization and what we stand for, that is uh, evidence that you you are being too lenient substantively with who's being let on the jury. Yeah. Well, that could be, I, I, sh I should mention that there was, a, there was a really remarkable Batson challenge after the peremptories were exercised. The, the defense did make a Batson challenge that they alleged the prosecutors were striking too many white males. And they did actually also mention in passing that three Republicans were struck. And uh, that was just presented as sort of an exacerbating factor. Um, the judge found essentially that not even a prima facie case was made. But I, th I think the direction this is going in, and there will be some powerful examples of bias, especially in the people that were struck, which is not irrelevant under the case law, even when you can find 12 who say, I can put it all aside and be fair. All right. So we have, uh, there's one other major issue that arose uh, that 
actually delayed the trial by a couple days, uh, which involved the uh, loss of the law license of one of the attorneys. Are we confident that at this stage, all of the Proud Boys defendants are adequately represented? Well, uh, there are some very good uh, lawyers there. And uh, the uh, defendant who just apparently lost his lawyer had two so and 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 the one he lost is one that joined only in june he's the first one has been there for almost two years and um the one that joined in june uh we were aware of the problem since august so he's sort of been on notice i i actually left the courtroom in order to come back so i could do this podcast so i don't know a hundred percent that it's been resolved. The problem is uh, that Joe Biggs' lawyer, he has two lawyers, Dan Hull and a guy named Norm Pattis. Norm Pattis, I mentioned that Biggs used to work for Alex Jones. Um, Norm Pattis was representing Alex Jones in his uh, one of his uh, defamation cases arising from his claims that the Sandy Hook shootings were 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 a hoax, and so Pattis was representing him in in the case where he lost a, a verdict for about a billion dollars. And but uh, he, he also uh, there was something he did there that led to uh, we don't have to get into it. But uh, he, he was uh, he has been suspended for six months in Connecticut. That's his only law license. And apparently, as it stood, uh, as I uh, when I left. The, the belief was that uh, this judge doesn't, uh, a federal judge didn't have the power to let him practice, given that that was his only law license. But we think we're still going to start openings tomorrow morning. And you will be live blogging it for Lawfare. Uh, tell us about uh, what you'll be doing and where people can find your coverage in real time. Yeah, I'm going to uh, live tweet and live blog this time. I live tweeted the uh, Oath Keepers case, uh, and that's uh, on my Twitter account at R Parloff, R-P-A-R-L-O-F-F. But we're going to be, this time, we're also going to be publishing the same text on on the, the Lawfare site. And you can find that. We will leave a link to the live blog in the show notes today. You can also always get to it from uh, the front page of Lawfare. Roger Parloff, we will also check in on little uh, trial update shorts over the course of the trial. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will check in soon. Great. Thanks, Ben. The Lawfare podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution Our audio engineer this episode is the intrepid Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo. Hey folks, have you tweeted about the Lawfare podcast recently or have you mastodoned about it? Have you shared us on Facebook? Have you made a TikTok video about the Lawfare podcast? Promote the Lawfare podcast. Get on it, people. Tell everybody at dinner parties about the Lawfare podcast. And when you do tell them about the Lawfare podcast, tell them that it is edited by Jen Patya Howell. And tell them that the music is performed by Sophia Yan. And tell them that if they listen to the Lawfare podcast, the next time I do the closing credits, I'll be talking to them when I say, and as always, thanks for listening.